with the healthy fruits and juices there but you could keep eating thank you all for coming but um okay so dear faculty staff students and guests thank you all for taking the time to attend the open ceremony of the science day event i love science how many of you love science <laughs> okay um Without much ado, we will now proceed with this event activities. We now call on our chair, Dr. Francisco Fernandez, chair of the Natural Sciences Department, to give us his opening remarks. celebrates in the college the science day. During the week of the science day, our faculty, staff, and students dedicate some time to reflect and participate in different activities related with sciences, in particular STEM disciplines. The purpose is to foster the essential learning outcomes of general education and key proficiencies important for long-term success and flourishing, enriching students' learning in the major, and preparing college students to successfully tackle the kinds of complex problems they will inevitably confront in work, civil society, and their own lives. General education invented to help the college students gain the knowledge and collaborative capacities they need to navigate the complex world. Is today a complex world. Is today and should remain an essential part of a high-quality college education. The essential learning outcomes of Yemen, as you know, are the knowledge of human cultures and the physical and natural world, the intellectual and practical skills, the personal and so social responsibility, and integrative learning. It is for this reason that today and in the next days, we are going to develop presentations of keynote speakers in different areas of science. The students are going to present posters about important scientific issues, as well as the students in class presentation of different scientific topics. Conversations with advanced science and engineering students, science contests, workshops, and movies presentations, all with the purpose of celebrating this day our commitment for the advance of our scientific knowledge. I want to congratulate the Science Day co-chairs, Dr. Damaris Lois Yamoa Lang, Dr. Anna Manukian, and Dr. Diao Jian. All the faculty, all the faculty and the staff of the Natural Science Department and other college departments working in an interdisciplinary way with us and our host students for making possible the success of this day. Thank you. <laughs> After my remarks, I want to introduce our president, Dr. David Gomez. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. This is not a baritone voice, I have a very bad cold. <clears throat> First of all, welcome to everybody. It's wonderful to see we have a full house. Look at this. And let me ask the question again. Who loves science? A little more enthusiasm, please. Thank you. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Werner von Braun, famous engineer uh, and scientist who supposedly once said, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. And while the same can be said about college presidents, and very often I don't know what I'm doing, though I pretend, I think it speaks to the importance of science in our lives and the obligation of the academy. We're called to challenge conventions and to accept the fact that the discovery of truth is a process and is not an end in itself. It's not a conclusion. That's what scientists do. 
And that's the importance of science, especially in this day and age when truth seems to be more fluid than it should be. I want to thank our faculty and staff for arranging today's wonderful series of events. I want to thank the students <clears throat> for the poster presentations we are about to see, for the discussions that we're about to have. I promise you that despite the fact that the provost and I are going to be popping in and out because of other meetings and operations, uh, we both plan to be present for as much of this as our schedules will permit. Will permit. And I want to thank uh, today's keynote speaker, Dr. Yaloa, for graciously agreeing to be with us today and sharing uh, his thoughts and knowledge with us all. So again, thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you for all you do for us, us and I know that you will enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to invite our provost, Dr. Christine Mangina, to give her opening remarks. Good morning and welcome to Science Day. It's an annual tradition of our natural science department. Our faculty work hard every year to bring you a day of interesting, content-rich, and fun activities. So I hope you'll have an opportunity to attend some other events today and the rest of this week. And again, my thanks also to the faculty and staff of Natural Sciences for organizing these great activities and always bringing in such interesting speakers. There are a number of classes, whether you take them in high school or college, where students say, why do I need to know this? Or how is this going to help me in life? Science classes are not usually the classes that invoke those questions, because science is all around us every day and all day long. It can be the waterproof coat you are wearing to keep us dry in the rain, the app that lets you know when the train will be arriving, and as you will hear this morning, the ability to use, personalized, to use personalized medical care to prevent diseases before we need to treat them. Our faculty always bring in dynamic speakers on the latest science initiatives, and today is no different. So enjoy the presentation this morning, and if your schedules permit, attend to other events today. I get it that as college students, you're busy enough with just your classes and everything outside of your classes, but it is also these extracurricular events that make up college life and that you won't always have access to attend events like these once you graduate. So take advantage while you're here. Our goal is to ignite a passion in you, to find that niche that excites you and drives you further in your education, so attend some other events. There are presentations by your fellow students later today. These students had the opportunity to conduct research with our faculty on a variety of topics. And not all the students were necessarily interested in the topics at the beginning of their projects, but when you hear them present, you will see and hear their excitement in the work that they have accomplished. Some have been able to present their research at national conferences, and we hope one day to invite one of you back to Ostos to be our guest speaker at Science Day. So reach for the sky, and congratulations for those of you that are graduating this semester. And thank you to Dr. Yamoa for coming to Ostos and for sharing your expertise with us. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Yamoha. Um, I'm going to read his biography to you. He was born in Temakana. Uh, he went to high school at Achimoto School at the age of seven. He entered college at the age of 13 at the University of Ghana, and he was the youngest student to have ever done so. Dr. Koshje obtained his bachelor's degree in medical sciences from the University of Ghana, and he completed his master's degree in biomedical sciences, obtained his MD and PhD degrees at Mount Sinai School of Medicine here in New York. He completed his residency at Thomas Jefferson University in radiation oncology. He was a chief resident there. He also uh, completed a research fellowship in prostate cancer disparities and epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania. He is currently an assistant professor and physician scientist at the Lynn Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute in Tampa, Florida. Uh, Dr. Yamoha's clinical focus is in genital urinary malignancies and he's committed to increasing access and quality of care among the minority population, particularly men of African descent. His research focus is on the biological factors that predispose African-American men to higher prostate cancer incidence and mortality. 
and he uses his research findings to inform targeted treatment recommendations in the clinical setting. Dr. Yamola had the opportunity to present his research at national and international meetings and offered over 30 peer-reviewed publications. He's an active member of Astro Global Health Committee with focus on work in Africa. He has won numerous awards and honors and is a respected member of the scientific community. He was recognized as one of Savoy Magazine's top black doctors in June 2017. He lives in Lutz, Florida, together with his wife, Jamie perez Moha and two children, Zion and Zoel. So please, let's welcome our speaker. It's really a big um, honor for me to be here this morning and uh, share this uh, part of your day with you. And I really want to thank the organizers for having me here and all of you for showing up, <laughs> thank you. Um, I want this to be a, a session where you, we can get to um, maybe look a little bit into genomics and, and, and cancer and how the field of medicine is really changing to embrace that in a very unique way. Um, so, back in 1990, there was this big initiative to start the Human Genome Project. How many of you have heard about the Human Genome Project here, yeah, right? where some crazy scientists, group of scientists said, you know, let's sequence the whole genome, you know, let's find out what the human genome is made of, right? It took them $3 billion and 15 years to accomplish that, that, that task, okay? A lot of people, a lot of work, and a lot of tears. But they completed it. Actually, the stats say that they finished a little bit sooner than they, they thought they were gonna be able to complete that. That project, told us two things. First of all, we are not that different from each other, okay? 99% of the genome is identical. 99.9% .9 is identical. Second thing that we learned from it was that the ability to know the genome can inform us. We can use that prospectively to understand the functions of the body and actually be able to intervene sooner. And that was where the advent of research really took off. So, today, you and I can sequence our genome for $100,000. Can you believe that? From $3 billion to maybe close to $1,000 you can sequence your genome. What does that mean? How does that inform us? How can we use that to really do good? Not all the time, but for the most part, right? <laughs> Okay, so let's take a step back and look at a little bit of how we can use genomic medicine, uh, genomics in actually informing us in personalized medicine, okay? Now I'm gonna be doing a little bit of head turn in here, so people are, um, let you guys follow what we're talking about. So I'm gonna go through a few definitions. So first of all, let's look at what we mean by genomic medicine. So when we talk about precision medicine, it's a medical approach that proposes to prevent and treat disease based upon a person's unique genetic makeup and their lifestyle habits. Okay, unique genomic makeup and their lifestyle habits. When you look at genomic medicine, this is the definition, a form of medicine that uses information about a person's genes, proteins, and environment to, to prevent, diagnose, and treat diseases. So, in cancer, you can, you can see that personalized medicine uses specific information about a person's tumor to help diagnose, plan treatment, and find out how well the treatment is working or make a prognosis, and I know there are a lot of good words there, we're gonna uh, break it down a little bit. So, there are two key points that I want us to take from here. The first one is this. Cancer of a given histologic diagnosis are genomic heterogeneous. What do I mean by that? If you look at an adenocarcinoma, or cancer of the supervisor, right? You can have an adenocarcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma. Now, you don't need to know those terms, they're just two terms saying that you can have two different histologies from the same organ. And when you drill down into the mutations within the genome, they are also very heterogeneous, they're all over the place. Now, this makes cancer a very complicated disease. Because even when you think you know about it, you really don't know about it. Let's take breast cancer. You look at breast cancer, you can have breast cancer as this, I don't know how But when you go down and sequence the genome, you find there are multiple mutations that are still causing the same problem. So you get a very genomically heterogeneous problem for even one thing. And so for decades, we've been trying to attack cancer because we're looking for a magic bullet. 
that they're not multipolar. Right? Because if you identify one mutation, there are 20 others that are causing the same problem. Right? And that's the complexity of oncology. That's the complexity of cancer. And I, I want us to break it down because if we don't, this actually gives us a window into actually addressing the problem for what it is. Right? Because you're not going to find that much of it. Okay? So the next thing is that cancer are mostly caused by somatic mutations and large genomic polymorphisms. In other words, most of the information about the disease is in the tumor genome and not the germline genome. And this causes a lot of confusion. I have to say that 90% of cancers is not because of inherited. Yes, there's a 10% or less that is inherited, but the majority of it is not because there's an amalgamation of insults that we develop over the, our lifespan that creates what we call mutations in the genome that affects the function, okay? And that's how we get, we get cancer. So the way to look at it is this. You can have, it's almost like a funnel. Everything in life, the, the food you eat, the environment, the air you breathe, everything, the, your, your activities, everything you do, even the, the sun, right? All those things, are impacting on the genome and causing a problem in the funnel and creating these strain on the body. And the body has an ability, inherent ability to repair itself. So constantly we get stuff and they call damage in our DNA and our body repairs it, that's no problem. But sometimes, sometimes the body fails to really repair those DNA damages and when they translate into aberrant or not functional proteins, then they begin to cause problems. So that the lack of repair is the first indicator that there's a problem in the, in the human genome. Because we're always getting mutations. From the time you're born up until you die, I'm sorry, your body's going to get insults, you're going to get some mutations, you're going to accumulate some of these things. But the repair mechanism is key. And the ability to repair or not repair is what determines what happens, right? Does that make sense? So, who knows this? Let's go through these two key things. Somatic versus germline, because this is where I think when we clear up our minds, we look at a lot better. So somatic mutations is what I just described, okay? You go through life, you get mutations, and you can get uh, in your tumors, breast cancer, prostate cancer, just name it, right? And that's why cancers are more common in adults. That doesn't mean they cannot fit in kids, but they are more common in adults because of accumulated insults in the body, okay? And most of them cannot be inherited. 90, nine, almost 90 or more percent of cancers fall in that category. There's a less than 10% that are germline where you actually have mutations in the egg or the sperm, and what happens is that those can be inherited. Those are cancer of familial origin. And for that reason, those are the ones that people are scared of because you are concerned about, you know, do I, do I pass it on to my offspring, you know, this. And so we do a lot of, you know, work as physicians to take family history. Typically, germline mutation cancer is also okay long term. And that's one of the indicators. When you think something is growing germline, it's probably going to occur a lot younger than the regular um, uh, 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 age of onset for most other cancers. So, who knows this famous person? Right? So, so let's talk about this a little more, okay? 2013, by the way, Angelina Jolie actually, his mother died from breast cancer. So she had a personal family history of that, and that was close to home, right? And she was also a lot younger, so there was family history, number one. Number two, they found a precancerous -pre lesion in her breast. And then, because of a strong family history of breast cancer at a younger age, that necessitated genomic testing. And that brought about the observation of a BRCA or BRCA1 mutation in a, in, a, in a tumor. So then she got an inherited version of it, right? The germline version. So obviously there are consequences to that. And there is a higher risk of not only breast cancer that was being found, but in the contralateral breast and ovarian cancer and all these other things. And so that caused some action called a prophylactic treatment. And then that exploded into this huge mass media of what's going on to all women who have this, get that. And, and, and I can tell you this is some of the hysteria that genomics can do, which is harmful, but we can talk about it more to give the, you guys an understanding of what it is, right? Because I think that's important. So she said this, I cannot tell my children that they don't need to hear that they will lose their money, they need to breast cancer, right? So that was a very sobering statement. And that sent out a ripple effect into the companies that used to do this genomic testing. Right? That 
in, in the Supreme Court overturned Marriott's um, patent on the BRCA1 and 2 in June of 2013, so that now you can get that tested for less than $100. It was very expensive back then. But because of that uh, 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 political initiative, it created a, a ripple effect and dropped down the amount of money needed to spend to get those tests, especially for women that could benefit from it. Again, less than 10%, but if you were that 10%, well, you better want to know that, right? Okay, so this is what I need you to pay attention to. 90% of breast cancer, which is BC, is sporadic. It simply means it's not going to be germline, it's, you don't have to worry about your kids or whatever. I mean, there are ways we can know to determine that by actually there are specific criteria, age of onset and things like that can help you narrow down if someone has the germline kind or the hereditary kind or not. Even with the heredity kind that is about 10%, only 25 of that 10%, 0.25% or you know, sorry, 2.5% of that is actually high penetrance genes, meaning that it, it means that you're gonna get the um, breast cancer because you had the mutations. Some of them are moderate, and a big proportion, 70% are actually of low penetrance, right? So it doesn't really mean that because you really have the BRC mutation, 100% of the time you're gonna get it. Why do I say that? This is the number. So let's look at this. Yes, there is a big percentage, 50% uh, or 85% will develop breast cancer at an early age if they do have the BRCA mutation. They can also get secondary primary uh, breast cancers 60% of, of the time, and you can also get ovarian cancer. So it's a, it's a big problem when you have the BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And it's also inheritable, right? So that, that's also another issue there. So this is a little bit of a background to show you what it's, what it's talking about. So I, I'm going to walk over a little bit. I'm not, I'm not sure the points are going to do justice here, but. If you look, what this means is that if you do have the BRCA mutation, by age 50, you have up to 50% chance that you're going to get breast cancer. If you didn't have the mutation, it's less than 2%, around 2%. So that's a big, big full change. And it gets even higher by age 70, right, compared to the general population. So even though that red bar graph there is only less than 10% of the population, if you're in that group, you want to know. You can't just say, oh, well, 90% are going to be fine, but if it's you, it's 100%. That's always what I tell my patients. When it's you, it's 100%. So you can say all the percentages you want. When I'm sitting in the office and I want to know, I want to know because to me it could be 100%. So it's important to recognize that numbers say something else, but when it's that person, it's important. So that became the first sigma that we have to find a better way of finding out who that 2.5% is and we can treat them appropriately and do it at a cost-effective manner because you can say, let's sequence the whole genome of the entire world to figure out 2% of them. That's too expensive. So this is the balance. That's why you know, we're having a lot of fight with the, with, the, with the insurance companies because they're trying to balance how much to spend and how much to gain from it. But it's important because each individual account, and I, don't, I will not put dollar signs on any in my life. So that's important. So we have to find creative means of it. Going on to, from this on to other cancers, now not only do the BRCA1 and 2 genes actually cause problems in breast cancer, but also for males, there is a risk of male breast cancer and prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, okay? Not as high, but it's up there. So even with men who have parents, mothers who have breast cancer at an early age, they are at risk of prostate cancer if they have carried a BRCA1 gene, right? So now it's becoming not only all the men were like, oh, this is not about me. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm coming to you now, right? <laughs> I'm getting to you, right? So that's it. And actually, I focus on prostate cancer. So that's going to be uh, 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 an interesting segue to see what I'm actually doing in my lab on that, right? So early detection can be a very important thing. If I can, we, we can find that early, we can prevent that a lot of people from dying, okay? So early detection becomes key. And how can we approach that? So this opens the window for a lot of you guys to get into a very exciting work as you really figure out what you want to do. I'm recruiting here. <laughs> so think about it. Look at the gray area. The last maybe 20 to 30 years, that's what we did, okay? All, say all the gray areas had cancer, right? Then they get treated the same. No, I mean, that's what we got. You get cisplatin, everybody gets it. You get surgery, everybody gets it. You get radiation, everybody gets it. Because that's what we got. We didn't care whether you were the BRCA person or not. Now, what we're beginning to do is we're beginning to now do molecular profiling of the genome, looking at the, the mutations in there to begin to rich stratify. And these are three important terms. Prognostic, predictive. Prognostic means that just based on your genetic, genetic makeup, if I take nothing to you, if you have a good prognosis, you're going to do well. Even if I didn't treat you, it's just a, a good problem, let's put it that way. Predictive says that based on your genomic makeup, 
I can predict how you're going to respond to something. It's not saying that it may be good or bad. It's just saying I'm going to predict your response. So a prognostic biomarker doesn't tell you how well you're going to do the treatment. It just tells you how bad your disease is or how, bad, or how not so bad it is. That's a prognostic biomarker. And we need both. Because we need to, we need to reach back to our patients to say maybe that pain person is someone that can actually do natural remedies and be fine. How many of you have had people who had cancer and did some natural remedy stuff and they, got, they, were, they were cured? I've heard so many anecdotes. It's not false, it's true. But they might have very good prognostic biomarkers so that they didn't need all that aggressive treatment. And another person who followed us in remedy and comes back to me in the office with stage 4 disease because two years ago they went to Mexico for something else because some friend told them that that's how you get healed, right? And this is that happens all the time. Because what's happening is that everybody thinks everything is the same. Oh my, some friend got breast cancer, went to take some juice blast and was cured. Great, great. I don't, I don't contradict that. But if you have a BRC or a mutation, you can drink all the juice you want. I'm sorry, that's not going to cure you. You see, so we have to understand that I think both sides have to work together here to really treat. I don't think there's something against, um, uh, you know, doing great stuff to heal you. But if you know what you're dealing with, then you can be informed. But there's a war going on, and it's an unfortunate war because we gotta work together. We need to understand how these natural remedies cure cancer, but at the same time know how the genomic work and all these intensive treatments can do the same. And by working together to do genomic work, we can actually identify the patient that does not need treatment out there and just needs some lifestyle medications, right? And the person down here that needs like four or five medications because that person has a different prognostic biomarker. And that's really where we're supposed to take this work and it's doing what we call personalized medicine, okay? So moving on, that, this is kind of a vision test here, it's not expensive to see, but this is how complicated it gets, right? We can start from using mutations within the genome, and those red and green things, we are almost like, we call them heat maps. If you've got it from the military, you want to use the heat maps to figure out who is walking along and stuff. But the same thing, the red ones are the hot genes, the whole expiration is the green ones are the expiration. So you can really use that to tell us which areas are active in the genome, which areas have mutations that you can really target and treat. So that's the genomic level. And then we go down to molecular signaling where you want to say, okay, those active genes, what proteins have they translated that is actually working, and that's where you need to go into mechanisms and signaling. And then you go into the tissue level itself and look at the architecture of the cells under the microscope, and you tell us, okay, there's some proteins that are causing these cells to behave this way or that way, and you can stain them, and by looking at how they look, you can figure out how aggressive they are. Are they organized? Are they disorganized? How's the nucleus looking like? You know, how's the cytoplasmic nuclear ratio? There's a lot of things going on. Are they blurring on the sides? Is there, is there something really intact? And there's all that information you gather from that. Then you lay it onto imaging, where you begin to say, okay, where is this located in the body? And are there areas of what we call hypoxia? Are there areas of the tumor that is really not getting much oxygen? It's also need the oxygen of your body. You figure out a way to just live without the oxygen. And so they are very, very aggressive because they've almost isolated themselves from your body and they're just doing their thing, right? They are very hot spots. Or they have so much vascularization that they got, they're almost driving in your blood supply into the tumors and the blood supply is feeding the tumors so much that they are highly vascularized, right? You can get all that information from imaging. And you can tell, you can layer genomics, protein, architecture, cell architecture, imaging studies to develop what we call a comprehensive biomarker picture of what a tumor is really doing. And at each step of the way, you can actually intervene. And so there are groups all around the world, all around the, you know, just studying these different specialized areas of genomic medicine and being able to you know, uh, uh, approach this in a more, more or less, uh, we call it multifactorial, multidimensional approach. And that's very exciting because now you cannot set up your lab on a mountain top and say, I'm going to figure it out. You got to work with people because you cannot be an expert in everything. So team science is taking over. Team science. If you are an expert in this, you are an expert in that, you are an expert in that, let's come together and talk about it. And once you find a team of experts that can really come together and really talk about these things, that's where breakthroughs happen. So it's been becoming a very exciting field. And just a quick example again of um, what is going on. So this basically is uh, giving us an example of the different uh, methods. So this is a human body, and all those um, acronyms are talking about different cancers. So GBM is in the brain, brain tumors, you know, HNC is head and neck cancer, screamer cell carcinoma, all the UAMD is lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, and lung cancer, screamer cell, BF, breast cancer, all of that. Right, so you have all these different cancers in different parts of the body. But using these up and coming cutting edge platforms, whether it's through the exome sequencing, messenger RNA sequencing, micro RNA sequencing, all these things, plus some SNPs, SNPs are simply 
uh, small nucleotide polymorphisms that can tell you, you know, different how certain genes might behave or not. All these things, methylation, which is epigenomic. So the genome is there, you can actually methylate a gene, put a methyl group on a gene, and silence the gene. So there's no mutation on the gene, right? But there's a methyl group on one of the bases, and it just silences the gene. So you can sequence the gene all you want, it's going to be normal. But unless you look at what other epigenomic mutations are on top, which is DNA methylation or acetylation, depending on how you, you know, which technique, you may not know the gene function. So that's for epigenomic. So you have to put all these things together. They can actually begin to reclassify disease. This is powerful. So now look at what's happening. <coughs> you, we, got, we have divergent, uh, uh, convergent and divergent processes where you have a long uh, adenoclasma and rich tumors, and it's also you find the same biology in bladder cancer. So now if I have a, a drug that works well on a certain target, it may work for lung and bladder, two separate cancers from two separate populations, and that's called targeted treatments. Because now what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the biology and saying that, yes, you may have lung cancer and uh, 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 bladder cancer, but it's the same pathway that is causing the cancers in the two different organs. So if I find a targeted treatment that works on a pathway, why not use it for both? This is breaking down everything we've known about medicine. Like, I'm a lung specialist, and you are the bladder specialist, and you are the breast, no, 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 because now, What's happening is if we find targeted treatments that can actually affect the pathway, then we break down those barriers. Because now we can treat patients based on the mutations and not based on the organ size. And that's actually a very new thing that the National Cancer Institute is funding several studies based on targeted treatments that can work across these sites, and not just for one or the other. Fascinating stuff. So I've talked about predictive and prognostics, I'm not going to believe at that point. Um, if we don't know where you're going, you're not, you're not going to get there. So what, 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 is that? what are we doing? What are we doing? What's the direction here going? This is where there is a lot of opportunity for research. A lot of opportunity here. So I'm going to use prostate cancer since that's my, my area of expertise and go and take a little bit of it, come up out of the bird's eye view into a little bit of the nose dive into what you can actually do. So here briefly, I'm just going to go over. This is a prostate. The little and walnut structure over there on top is the bladder, the rectum is somewhere behind it. And this is a nice gland, right? The round cycle is a gland. Some of you know what that you know, looks like. You have a nice subtle outline there. This is normal. Normal. Now you can go down where you start having cells disorganized and breaking up, coming to the lumen, which is called, it's called uh, the high grade dysplasia. They're not really cancer yet, they're precancerous, but they're about to become cancer, right? And then when they become full blown cancer, you can tell that they're kind of invading into, into that, you know, breaking it up, right? They're they call it invasive disease. That's going to be where you think you have cancer. So you made a diagnosis of invasive disease. At that point, when the patient's in front of me and he asks me, Doctor, what are my chances? I have no idea. You know, if, you, if you go to the doctor and say, Well, you got three months, but we always wrong. We just throw these numbers out, we always wrong. I always say only God knows right, how much you will have. Right? You can you cannot know, right? We've all, but the important thing is some people will have this indolent disease in their prostate forever and nothing happens. That's going to be the purple line. They could even not get treated. And they'll be fine. It's going to stay there. No problem. They, something else, maybe heart disease, diabetes, whatever. Not that. Other people are given within three to four years, five years, they have disease all over their body. Who is that person going to be when they are sitting in front of me? I just don't know. At this stage, I have no idea who that person is. And that's scary. Very scary. Because if I don't have a way of really triaging how I treat somebody, I could actually either over-treat or under-treat. And at that point, if I'm a very treat-happy doctor, I just treat everybody because I don't want to talk about it. And if I'm not, then I actually, you know, under three people and then they get in trouble. This is why we have such a messed up healthcare system because everybody's kind of trying to do what they want to do because no one knows what the right thing is, right? So, but what can we do? We can actually begin to understand that if we can help, let biomarkers guide us. If I can find out who is actually has aggressive disease, maybe I can help that person treat the person earlier or even do preventative measures early on in their life to really help prevent that because they have a higher risk of, of, of uh, a problem, right? So, Quick question for you guys. You know, what percentage of clinicians in the New York State use biomarkers for managing their patients with prostate cancer? Who says A, less than 10%? How many of you say A? B, 25%. Wow, I'm just got small. 50%. Nobody. 70%. I got some 70 over there, right? You vote too. 100%. 
Everybody, this is in New York State, everybody says, I got a few good, 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 good answers about that. But the answer here is 100%. <laughs> no, no, don't clap yet. This 100% is because of one blood biomarker, which was discovered like 100 years ago that we all still use. The answer is PSA. Right? Ed, Ed, every man here at 1040 go to the doctor and want to do a PSA. Now they're being doing guidance against it. I, I, I don't want to go on that soapbox yet. But PSA test is a blood test. You know, that will tell you if, you are, if it's high. It's a biomarker. That's what a biomarker is. It's simple. Unfortunately, we've complicated biomarkers to become this scary thing. We use biomarkers all the time. What it is, is we are transitioning to genomic biomarkers, which is here to stay. I have to tell you that. It's no longer just going to be one blood test or one thing to say whether you're low or high. We have to go a little deeper to understand what mutation landscape we have. So we use it here, and this is how we use it. You have PSAs, now your PSA starts rising, and you have other features, then you may get radiation or surgery, or surgery followed by radiation, and that PSA is supposed to drop. So that's the biomarker that you've been treated. Some people stay down there forever. They don't have any other issues. And then that's it. Other people will begin to get what we call disease recurrence, meaning the prostate cancer recurs. And at that point, if you get radiation or if you get some hormonal treatment or something, and you expect the PSA to go down again, and you could stay down there forever. Others might have the PSA coming again, and we call that castrate resistant, meaning that it's not, with, it's not sensitive to the hormonal treatment anymore. No, that's a scary place, right? Now, the timeline for that could be very short for very aggressive disease, or very long for indolent disease. So you could have someone just staying down the first time and never really going up anymore, someone having all that in five years. We don't know. But that's the biomarker we're using for years. It's lousy, but that's all we got. So, in the last couple of years, we've had biomarkers to help us more determine how best to add it on to what we know from PSA, to help us know who needs aggressive treatment or not. And you can get some from blood, some from urine, and some from tissues. All these companies are working in this space. And this is how these biomarkers lay on to this picture. So in the early stages, we can use these. Somewhere in the middle, we can get to use these. And then someone told us, and you have these biomarkers going on. So now we are better able to determine those that are actually going to be having a higher risk of cancer versus those that should be treated more aggressively. And this is um, exposure to biomarkers. Every other almost six months, there's something coming on the market.